Welcome to the podcast for Gateway Baptist Church. You're listening to a message from our Mackenzie campus. Find us at gatewaybaptist.com.au if you'd like to connect with us as we seek to change lives by following Jesus in our community, our nation, and our world. Welcome to church. Please uh, keep talking to people, not now necessarily, but afterwards go into the coffee shop, catch up with people. Make sure you find a face you don't know. Introduce yourself. We love welcoming people here. Again, let me add my welcome to you today. If this is one of your first times with us at Gateway, we'd love to have you part of our church family. We're in a series, as Tim mentioned before, called Story. We're at week three, and we're working through Psalm 107. And so as we progress through the psalm, if you've been following with us in life group or in your own private study, you would know we are up to Psalm 107 and verse 17. So if you would uh, turn to that in your Bibles, Psalm 107 and verse 17, or look at the screen if you need to. The Bible says this, Fools, because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food, And they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that man would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and declare his works with rejoicing. Now, this scripture is fairly confronting because it starts with the word fools. And uh, the Bible doesn't often start with that, except when it wants to get our attention to let us know that the bit that's about to come after it is actually something we've got control of, that we can actually make a choice in so that the outcome won't come our way. Fools, because of their transgressions, and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. You know, there's, there's the numbers of afflictions we can have in our life that have nothing to do with us. They are outside of our control, they're outside of our hands, they happen to us, they happen to people that we love, and they are not something that we control. But this scripture is not talking about that, it's talking about iniquity, transgression, or sin, things that we are choosing that as a result of choosing that sin, that we have afflictions that come upon us. And that's why the Bible calls it foolish. Today, what I don't want to do is bang on about that sin is wrong and that we as people are bad and that we need to get our act together. That is not where we're going today. And I want to be really clear about that as as we kick off. I think the world needs more from the church than that. We don't need to be a church that stands on our soapbox and declares that everybody else is a sinner and they're all going to hell. Because the reality is, by the same grace that everyone else needs to be saved, so too do we. What the church needs right now is not a message of condemnation, but it needs a message of grace and love. It needs a message that actually looks inward to itself first and says, God, what is it about my life that needs to change? so that I can make a difference for you in the world around me. But when you look around you, there's no denying that sin is a harsh taskmaster. We are seeing the devastation of sin around our world. There is brokenness, there is disorder, misery and pain, suffering, illness, torments, adversities that come to people. Sin is running rampant around this world and is a great trap. It's a trap because people are falling into the trap not knowing that it's a trap and once they're there, they're caught by the enticements of sin and can't get out. One of the privileges of being a pastor, but I guess also one of the um, great challenges and burdens of being a pastor is that you get to do the journey with people that are doing some pretty tough journeys. John was a guy that, in a different church, in a different context for me, started a business and had great aspirations for where that business would go. It was 
a great family investment. It took all of their energy. It took all of their finance. It required a significant amount of sacrifice personally to get the thing up on its feet. And an enormous amount of weekly sacrifice, as it does in any business, to really nurture this business onto its feet. And John would enjoy coming home and just snapping the top off a a cold beer and sitting down and just having one or two, sometimes three or four, just to take the edge off what's been a big day and then the alarm would go early the next morning and it would all start again. And so every night, just that chance of taking the edge off, he'd often fall asleep on the couch and then find himself in bed. Somehow or other he must have staggered there somewhere through the night and that would happen night after night. But as things happen, businesses have upsides, businesses have downsides and as the business is down, he's needing more support and comfort. And so he starts to make the choice that the beer really isn't enough. Maybe some wine would be better, a couple of glasses, half a bottle, a full bottle. And after a while, it's not really wine, it's spirits. And then, and then now he's absolutely falling asleep way earlier. His family are getting disengaged. His marriage is starting to tremble a little. And then the business fails. And why? Because, you know, not only is he sneaking a drink at night time, now it's at lunchtime. There's long lunches, there's afternoons hiding away. He's finding a park somewhere to sleep it off as he's trying to get through the tension of managing this business. John's an alcoholic. His wife leaves him, his business fails, and he's on his own. See, John didn't start out like that. That wasn't the plan. John was looking for something that he genuinely needed. He needed strength to get through the challenge. And so he, he, he decided to grab something that could help him do that. And it was a good idea, or so it seemed at first, because it was helping him get where he needed to go. But here's the challenge of sin. And, and look, let me just pause for a minute. What I'm not going to do today, what I'm not saying is alcohol's bad. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, There's a choice inside John he was trying to make. He was looking for strength. But in looking for the strength, the thing that he chose, no matter how much he took of it, it couldn't give him what he was looking for. So more of it wasn't going to help. I don't mind you have drink if you want to drink. It's fine. The, The person who rules their soul and has strength has great freedom in many things. The worth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So allow that fullness and the generosity of God to be enjoyed would be my view. But John's choice was devastating. And that's a little bit like sin. It promises a whole lot that after we walk down the road a little bit further, it starts to renege on its promise. And what we originally start to choose, we can now no longer not choose. Where we were master, now we are servant. And it's bossing us around. And it's telling us what we should do and when we should do it. The Bible gives us a bit of a window into the power of sin. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, it says this, that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There is a way that seems right to a man. See, it seems right. Sin and the the allure of what we want to do, it makes sense. It feels comfortable. It actually is good for a season. And to pretend anything different is being all pious and shut away. It's not true. It is good for a season. What starts out as a flirtatious moment in the office that then becomes a little bit more than that and a secret rendezvous and an opportunity to explore things further is starting to feel good because my ego is getting stroked. And you know, well, I can tell myself this is going to be good for my home life because at least I'm starting to feel something now. I'm glad because then I can take that home. But the reality is, as I walk further down that road, I get caught. And now it's not quite so easy. And now it's not quite so easy to back out of. And and it's going to be heartache and pain. And it's not just me that suffers now, but it's another life. And then it's another marriage and it's children and it's et cetera and et cetera. The deception starts out appealing and satisfying. I have a video I want to show you here of um, a child playing with a cobra. 
It's fairly confronting. And I'm not trying to be sensational this morning, but I want to give us an illustration that we remember. I, I'm not big on snakes, so as I'm standing here facing you, I don't like them. I don't know about you, I don't like them. But I look at this kid, and he's holding this pretty thing with this lovely canopy or whatever the thing's called. Someone will correct me later. And it's playing with it. It probably feels nice, like an expensive handbag or something, I imagine. <laughs> but I don't know whether this does it in this particular clip, but they've taken the fangs out, but it strikes him, strikes him, strikes him. Because the instinct of the cobra is to keep looking after itself. And the mums and dads in the room looking at this are going, what is going on? It's like how God looks at us as we grab hold of sin. And we think, oh, isn't it pretty? And it feels so good. And it starts to strike us. We go, oh, that wasn't hurting so bad. I'll keep hanging on to it. And what we think we're getting in the bargain is actually not what it delivers in the end. We develop this appetite on the inside that starts to become habitual, that we can no longer break free. It's what the Bible calls strongholds. We are caught in a stronghold. And all of the strength it took to get involved in the stronghold, there's not enough to be able to back out of it. It's got us. I love chocolate. And if you're if you're anything like me, there's just not enough chocolate you can eat. In fact, I think, the Bible's make a slight mistake, I think in heaven it's not streets of gold. I think it's actually chocolate streets. You remember that? Amen. Hey, amen. Um, you know, you remember that ad where Cadbury had the streets where they could walk through and you could break off a lamppost and you could pick up a fire hydrant and you could eat it? And I thought, that would be heaven for me. That would be... Around 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I, all I can think of is Kit Kat. Kit Kat. And I go hunting through this place for anything that's left over from a kids program, a youth program, a nighttime function that's been on. Surely someone hasn't spent their whole budget and there's something left over. Like a madman. Here's the thing. What's happening inside my body at 2 o'clock? is I need food, I, my sugar is low or whatever, and I'm not going to hypothesize what's going on, someone else will know better than me. But I have learnt to love chocolate. My brain is not, my body is not saying get chocolate, my learnt behaviour is saying get chocolate, do you see? And so for all of us, the sin that you're fighting is going to be different to the sin that I'm fighting because the appetites that we've built inside us will be different. But there'll be something inside us when temptation comes knocking. Temptation looks like something for you. Different for me. If someone was to put on the stage here today a couple of bags full of gold and the keys to the bank down the road and the swipe card and the code and everything that I need and said it's all yours, run with it. There's nothing in me I can honestly say that I want to pick that up and do that. I just don't have a desire to steal their money. I don't have a desire for it. But I know there'd be people who would look at that and would be so tempted. The temptation inside them, they would already be scheming for what they could do to hide it and how they'd be able to work with it and how it could disappear and what they could make it do. Why? Because for them, that's the temptation. And that's why I know as we go around the room that our stories will be different in this, our temptations will be different than this. But one thing I know is, Sin is making you an empty promise. That, I know, is common. And God wants to help us with that empty promise. Brian, again, a young man that uh, I met with five or six years ago, not a member of this church, but it's a story that could be told again and again and again. As a teenager, he was introduced to pornography. Pornography. I just want to pause for a minute and say, you know, we need to pray for this generation because never before in such a hyper-sexualized society has it been more accessible for young men and women who are going through incredible change, hormonal, you know, changes that they're getting access to visual images that can literally grip them for life. It's one of the most insidious plans of the enemy ever. And if you're at home and you've got 
young kids around you, please do what you can to protect them. Because they can't always make the right choice themselves. And so Brian wasn't making that choice either. And as a teenager, he got addicted to porn. And he said to himself along the journey, well, when I get married, though, it'll change because I'll have a wife and, you know, the urges that I have inside will be satisfied differently. And so he'd constantly tell himself that, of course, until he got married and then nothing changed. So habitual was that practice that really it was like the other woman. And the embarrassment, the shame, the guilt, and of course then Brian ends up in my office and we begin a journey together. Can I tell you, it starts out feeling good. And there is a way that seems right to a man that at that point in time, we make the choice because it is giving us something. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called temptation. But it gives us, it rewards us. The whole idea of forgiveness, I will not forgive them. They have done me wrong. I don't care what they preach, but he's wrong. And until he apologizes to me, until I get a written apology for the way they stole or robbed or said or did or whatever it is they did, I don't care. I deserve to not forgive them. And forgiveness becomes bitterness. And bitterness becomes resentment. Resentment becomes hate. And there is a way that seems right to a man. And this seems right because I'm owed something. And Jesus stands at the door and knocks and says, give it up. No. No, you don't understand, God. I was wronged. I want justice. And so that person journeys through life a bit further and they wonder why with the next trigger that comes up or the next person that wrongs them, they quickly go from peace to resentment to hate. And everything seems to escalate quite quickly. Why? Because now they're starting to habituate this idea that I'll carry any offence I want to carry. I want justice. It needs to serve me. And we build the pattern inside. We can go around all sorts of different examples and it's not my purpose to do that, but I want to illustrate that that's the enticement and the allure. It always looks good. There's a statement that says, broken people break people. Wounded people wound people. Hurting people hurt people. I think it's true. And we're all on that journey at some point. We're always somewhere along that spectrum as we walk with God. Moses talked about the two ways that sin enters into a human life and it's kind of buried into a really well-known part of Psalm 91. But it's a really wonderful key that I'd just love to dig out for us to look at today just to be aware of. It's in Psalm 91 and in the first three verses. And it says this, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Here it comes. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and the perilous pestilence. Don't you love New King James language? Perilous pestilence. The snare of the fowler, the perilous pestilence. What is those two traps? Well, what's a fowler? A fowler is someone who sets a trap on the ground for a bird who's flying safely in the sky. But as a result of seeing the bait on the ground, leaves the safety of the sky where the fowler cannot get them. To walk on the ground on legs that were not designed for long-term walking, to take the bait at which time they can be captured. The appetites of the bird cause the bird to leave the safety. Sin is first an appetite inside you. The snare of the fowler. What is the perilous pestilence? Well, we're talking about a pestilence is an infection. It's a, it's a plague that would sweep through people. Normally it's caught from one to the other, so someone else's infection is caught by me. There is a condition of sin that we see modelled, we hear it, we, we're part of society, it's in culture, it rubs off on us, and we are infected by the decisions that others are making and we start making the same decisions. 
the perilous pestilence. Moses is saying there's two things you've got to guard your heart against. One is the appetites of your heart and the associations you keep, the influences you allow around your life. I don't think it's changed in thousands of years for anybody else. Hebrews 12 and verse 1 says this, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. There is a sin that will easily ensnare you. Or in other words, you have a sin pattern. There is a thing, a way, a weakness, a pattern inside you that is, leans towards sin. And here's the thing. The devil knows it. He knows you. He watches you. He sees you. If you can sit in your office uh, area on your professional development days and fill out your personality charts with your ISJN3756 code or whatever you are as a personality and you can work out what you're a sanguine or a whatever and we can categorize people and all those things, don't you think the enemy knows you better than that? I don't want to give him any glory but I will say this, he's smart and he watches you and he's watched billions and billions of people before you and he knows exactly what your snare needs to be. He's got a trap set for you and he'll put them up every single time until you show that you're not tempted or until you're really not tempted. The enemy sees your pattern. The Apostle Paul talked about an evil day that's planned for all of us. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. There's evil days planned for you. Maybe all, it's not something to be afraid about. It's not something to be worried about is something to be prepared for there's an evil day and the devil is taking his time to make sure he sets it up for you the irony is God's not going to stop the evil day <laughs> he said hang on a minute I thought there was going to be some good news in this preach this morning we're getting to the good news but God doesn't stop the evil day that's the thing about free will you know we celebrate free will we say God I, I want free will I want to choose what I want to choose and so we make our choices and one choice leads to the next and the next and the next and sometimes we find ourselves in a hole and then we say, God, I'm not so happy with free choice anymore. Could you just rescue me? Could you just override my will, stop me from doing the dumb things I'm doing and set me free? Of course, the reality is he, he, he will do that because he's God and he's graceful. But that's the irony of free will. People want to blame God for so much when really they chose it themselves. Anyway, that's a little bit extra from the side. God's been using the devil's plans since the beginning of time to further his purposes. The devil is not anything that he is particularly concerned about. In fact, he uses him time and time again to accomplish his purposes. The Bible says that they'd never crucified Jesus on the cross. Had the powers of darkness really known the blow that was going to be served on them. They had no idea. God, in all of his wonder and strategy and mystery, shrouded the whole purpose of what he was doing with Jesus. And the triumphant resurrection of Jesus means we are free. And the devil played his part in that to make sure the whole thing happened. <laughs> Don't you love knowing that your father's in control in the end of the day? Let's have a look at... Uh, how God does save us out of our distress, because he does. Even though we've dug the hole, God rescues us. In Luke chapter 22, there's a little wonderful encounter that happens between Jesus and Peter. The context is this, that Peter is about to deny Jesus three times. He's about, he's about to say, God, I'd never deny you. And of course, Jesus is about to say, well, you're about to deny me. Just previously before that, he's just named Jesus as the Son of God, and Messiah. And Jesus has said, that flesh and blood hasn't revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. That's the first utterance in the world that Peter makes 
of the reality that he is both Jesus is Messiah and Son of God, Son of Man. It is a wonderful coming together of that story. And Peter declares it and Jesus goes, wow, that's what my church is going to be built on, that revelation. And we sit here today because of that revelation and we're still singing about it. And then Jesus goes on to say that all of you disciples are going to sit over the 12 tribes of Israel in my kingdom and rule forever. Like these guys have got the top job in the kingdom of God. And then Peter says the following. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you. Ever found the devil comes at you right at the point where you're sitting on your best moment of revelation. He comes to steal it. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. It's interesting to me here that Jesus didn't, the devil came to Jesus and said, I'm going to sift him like wig. And Jesus didn't say, oh, no, you won't. Huh. Hang on. Aren't you meant to be protecting me, Jesus? Jesus didn't say, oh, I'm, not going to, I'm going to let that happen. What I'm going to do is pray that your faith won't fail. In other words, there is a sifting that happens of our life as we learn to turn from the sin that easily ensnares us and choose God. Something happens deep inside us, faith is formed, and we take hold of some gold that's been refined by fire that no one can ever take from us. And the process has to be the process because through it we learn to walk strongly with God. God puts things in us that no one can take from us. He removes temptation from us that no longer becomes temptation in the process of the refining. So Jesus didn't stop the enemy from sifting him as wheat. He prayed for his faith. And then he said, when you've returned to me, do the job I've wanted you to always do, and that's strengthen your brethren. God uses the process of your fight against sin to teach you his ways. Just have a closer look at this. How does God help us? When Jesus prayed, that his faith wouldn't fail. There's something about faith that God wants us to have. What is faith? Well, faith firstly says that God is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek us. In other ways, faith says God is real, and if I ask God for help, he'll help me. Now, there's plenty of people today who are running around challenged by all kinds of situations and problems, but they're not turning to God. Why? They don't have faith. But if you've got faith in God, you will cry out to God in your time of need. That's an indication of your faith. So faith turns to God when we need it because faith says, well, where else will I go for a start? Faith says God has the answer and if I trust him, he will help me. That's what faith says. Faith knows that God hasn't sent the pain that sin has caused. Did you notice that it was the devil's plan for pain it was God's plan for his faith. God does not send the pain that sin causes. Sin brings its own pain. Therefore, God is not the villain in that. It's our weaknesses that give devil, the devil his power. And then Jesus said this, when you have returned to me, and when you have returned to me, See, returning to God is normal. As a church, right across the world, we've got to get to the place where repentance, turning around and coming back to God is not considered a shameful thing. It's not considered a, an awful thing. It's not considered a wrong thing. But repentance is a godly thing. Repentance is the best thing you can do. Can I tell you, repentance is life and health to you. Repentance is the way of God. Jesus said, when you have returned to me, when you have returned to me, when you have turned from where you were and come back to me, go back about the business I've called you to. Strengthen your brethren. Repentance. Repentance. We don't speak about it enough. 
We don't put it on the agenda enough. Repentance sees that God has something better than what I had in my hand before. Repentance should be celebrated. Repentance should be something we go, yes, repentance is daily. Repentance is every moment. It's like, God, I live before you. Help my heart become contrite. Help my heart be sensitive to you. Help me release to you early the things I need to and not hold them for any length of time. God wants to retrain what we've learnt to love that is hurting us. He wants to take it out of our hand like a cobra that we don't understand. He wants to take it out of our hand and say, not that. Don't play with that anymore. I've got something better for you. There is a place I believe that Jesus meets us and we see a picture of this in the 23rd Psalm. I like to call it the table of repentance. It's probably a table of many things for different people at different times. The 23rd Psalm has a richness about it. But go with me to verse 5, the 23rd Psalm, and it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Jesus is saying to us, I am in the presence of your enemies. I have put myself there. And your heart is saying, oh, I didn't know they were my enemies, Lord. I thought they were my friends. And Jesus says, no, they're not your friends. They've lied to you. They've cheated you. And the thing you thought was going to reward you is causing you death. And so at this table, we have this intimate fellowship. And we begin to see that at the table, there is a greater source of strength here for me than there was in the thing that I was choosing. And God's starting to train our hearts now. See, you're getting strength from that, but it was actually killing you. Here, say at my table. What happens at my table? Well, you anoint my head with oil. Why do I need oil? Because, well, my skin is dry. I'm dry on the inside. I'm, I'm in need and I've gone crusty. And I'm not supple before you, God. But I'm going to... Jesus said, well, I'm going to rub some oil in and it's going to start to soothe. And as I first start rubbing, it's going to hurt a little bit because dry skin just hurts a bit when you start to massage that in, yeah? But as it goes in, it's going to become supple and you're going to feel again what the skin is meant to feel like. The dryness, the isolation is going to go and you're going to know I'm with you. Jesus, what else are you going to do? Well, you're going to fill my cup. My cup runs over. What's in my cup? It's the wine of your spirit. It's, it's joy. It's liberty. It's the sense of contentment and fellowship. I've, I've got that now. And the irony is all of this wonderful fellowship is happening with my enemies pressing in at my back. Have you ever noticed that your sweetest time with God is often your most desperate time? You thought, why is that? Because the 23rd Psalm says that's what it's going to be like. You're going to be in your most desperate time. Your enemy, you're breathing down your neck, but you'll have your back to them and leaning into the fellowship of the table. And God will speak to you and he'll change you and he'll help you. God is a good God. The Psalm 107 says this, when they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, he saved them. Don't think for one minute God's not interested in saving you. Can I tell you, he is standing at the door of your life and knocking even now. The hundredth time, the thousandth time, the ten thousandth time you promised him you were going to stop or cease or quit or whatever it is, he just keeps coming back. You say, how come? Hasn't he quit on me yet? I said, no, he hasn't. I know he hasn't. He stands at the door of your life and he knocks. And he says, if anyone will open that door, I will come in and sup with them, fellowship with them. I will prepare the table for you. We'll sit together. This morning I want to create a space for us just to respond in the privacy of our heart. You know, we often ask people to come to the altar here, but I'd like to create an altar where you're sitting. That in your heart where you are, you could say, God, I need to get some business done with you this morning. I need to talk to you. I need to open my heart to you in different ways. Maybe you need to say, I'm sorry. Maybe you need to say, God, I'm promising one more time. Help me. Maybe you need to say, God, show me. Give me strength. Help me to get out of where I am. 
I don't know what that prayer should be, but my heart has been aching for the last week or so that this is an opportunity for people just to do business with God privately, just in the thoughts of your mind if you want to, as a whisper coming out of your mouth if you want to, but just here in this space. Just before we do it, could I put a prayer up on the screen that might help us? Some will know how to pray in this moment and others won't quite know what to say. And that's okay. I reckon one of the greatest prayers of repentance that the Bible has is Psalm 51. As David is praying lots of words, he has committed adultery with one of his senior officer's wives. He has then murdered the officer. He has then lied about it to the people. And then the prophet Nathan comes and he lies to his face as well. David's in a fairly big hole. He's the king of England. A uh, king of England. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> he's the king of Israel. And he prays this prayer. Creating me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Creating me a clean heart. Why does he pray that? Because his spirit has allowed him to choose something that in his previous life he would never have imagined. He has done some things that when he was the boy writing Psalms, when he was playing his harp and the evil spirit was leaving Saul, he wouldn't have imagined that he'd be capable of this. And yet he's just done it. His spirit has become sick. And then he says, don't cast me away from your presence. Somehow or other, he's been able to live without the presence of God for the last period of time. He has gone on with life without any consciousness of the God he wrote Psalms about. And now he's saying, God, come back and visit me, please. Cast me not away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. And here's the thing, church. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted. Can I say, before we stand on our soapbox as a church and tell people about their sin, I think God's saying to us, let's get our house in order. God created in me a clean heart. And because the righteousness of God will shine out of me, because of what he has done, others will see it and inquire. What is it about your life? What's going on? It's not because we preached fire and brimstone to their ears, but because we've lived the life of love, because God's changed us. Yeah? Could we bow our head? Could I pray for us? Then I just want to give us a couple of minutes, maybe just a minute, to just do business with God. Father, this morning I pray for every person in this place. God, would you move by your Spirit? It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. God, this morning we want to celebrate our ability to choose you. To turn from where we are. To stop doing the things that we are doing. And reach out for you in a fresh and new way. Father, would you give us strength this morning? Would you give us faith this morning? That we could make that choice. And put our trust in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. While the worship team is just playing softly, could I ask you, just let's just take a minute and pray. In the privacy of where you are, just talk to the Lord.
Father, our prayer this morning is that you would forgive our sin. You would heal our hearts. You would heal our families. You would heal our communities. You would heal our scorched and parched land. God, that you would move and bring the rain of your presence and power upon us as a nation. God, would you refresh that which needs to be refreshed? Would you renew that which needs to be renewed? You are the source of our faith and life. You are the source of the land that we live on. And God, this day, we ask you would move in our lives by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Could we stand together this morning? And ask the team this morning just to lead us in a worship song. Uh, as we do. And as you sing, I'm going to ask the prayer team if they'd come as well. There'll be some people here this morning and you'll say, I need to respond a little bit more than what I've just done now. I need to come. I need to speak to someone. I want some prayer, someone to help stand with me, strengthen me, help me. If that's you, then please come and see see these folk out the front. They'd love to pray with you. They'd love to be a support to you as a church. So we're going to start to sing. If that's you, come as we start to sing and receive the ministry. We hope you've been blessed by this message. If we can pray for you or you would like to take a further step in your relationship with Jesus, we would love to connect with you. Please head to gatewaybaptist.com.au and click on Get Connected to let us know.